Thanks, Andrew. Oh, so a warm welcome to um, HST and M. Is anybody here for the first time? Particular welcome to you and to you. Um, so this is a, a very remarkable institution, and uh, we're so glad to be uh, uh, meeting in person. And it was great to meet you, Kevin, who came for Rowan Williams and now have come back. That's what we hoped would happen. If you're one of those people as well, then uh, particular welcome back to you. We only get the highest quality of speaker, Harrogate School of Theology and Mission. I hope you've noticed that. Um, how could we draw a line from Rowan Williams to the next person? Well, there was only one option, really. And that, and that was Professor Paul Foster. Um, Paul has been in Edinburgh for really quite a long time, 21 years, because it is a great department to be part of. Uh, he's been part of that fabric with a very stable staff actually for that time and there are things that people know about Paul in the world of New Testament studies. <laughs> One is he's a prolific reviewer so he, he he's responsible for the uh, book, book list in expository times so a um, lot of people have had their books reviewed by Paul. The breadth of his knowledge is another thing which he's famous for so he began in Matthews, done a bit with apocryphal gospels, uh, there's a very short introduction to the Apocryphal Gospels that uh, you may have come across. Uh, also, the Absolute Fathers, which we're going to encounter today, and uh, commentary on Colossians. That's quite a lot of entry points into different parts of early Christianity, which tells you that Paul is somebody who enjoys looking at the whole picture and how those bits fit together. So what I'm hoping is that you've come today thinking, well, I, I know that there's something that happens next, after the New Testament, but I'm not quite sure what that is. And Paul is a perfect man to help us uh, see how that picture develops and how it might inform our understanding of our own faith today. So Paul, do come and uh, introduce us to the Apostolic Fathers. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. It's my total pleasure and delight to join with you today. And um, I want to thank Alan publicly and his wife, Emma, for the hospitality that I enjoyed last night. One of the texts we're going to look at today, which is uh, loved by Alan and I, the Didache, says, if you have a traveling prophet or teacher come to you, if they stay more than three days, you know they're a false prophet. Or if they command a meal, you should not entertain them. I promise I will go this afternoon just so you can have that there. So I guess what you're wondering is why are you here today? What you're, what are you going to learn about? Is this going to be some arcane, irrelevant professor speaking to you today? And the answer to that is probably yes a bit, but hopefully not entirely. So what can these figures from maybe nearly 2,000 years ago tell us about contemporary Christianity? Well, they probably weren't mic'd up and didn't have PowerPoint presentations. But despite that, some of the things they say to us are incredibly fresh and relevant. You probably won't start to Alan Sorrow reading the Didache in church tomorrow and preaching from it, but we do see how the faith continues. And one of the reasons I asked for the passage from 2 Timothy to be read in worship was because it's at a stage of transition. The Apostle Paul, as he's portrayed in that letter, says he has fought the good fight. He has run the race. He's coming to the end of his life. The situation that's assumed there is that he's in Rome. He's about to be executed for his faith. He's going to be poured out as the drink offering. So what happens when you lose one of your foundational figures, when your church or community is in transition? How do you ensure that the next generation can continue running the race, fighting the fight, proclaiming the faith. And in some ways, that's what we'll look at. Paul passes that charge on to Timothy, which is sort of part of the second generation. 
We're now with the Apostolic Fathers, roughly looking into what we might call the third generation of the Christian movement. So the Apostolic Fathers, I cannot give you a date for all of them. Some of them are hard to date, but if we're broadly thinking, maybe from um, Alan would like to place the Didache early. So let's say sometime in the first century until definitely before the end of the second century, probably around the 150s, 160s, the group of writings I'm going to tell you about date roughly from the first half of the second century, maybe some earlier, maybe some slightly later. This in some ways is a slightly unknown period. We're familiar with all the New Testament writings, but that period in the early second century is a bit of a dark age in some ways. When we get to the end of the second century, we have a very important figure writing a large work, Irenaeus of Lyon, who has his Against Heresies, Contra Hieresis, and this is a large work. After that, we have Tertullian, then we're into the third century with towering figures like Origen, and then real Petrus, not like me, real students of the church, concentrated on Augustine, but they're far too involved and clever for me. I have to go with the simpler stuff, I'm afraid. But we are looking at how the church evolves. I've spoken to a few of you, many of you are involved or have been involved in church ministry. Some of you are going or have gone to more independent churches. In some sense, the early Christian movement was a lot of independent congregations. Part of the excitement of that is the spontaneity, the enthusiasm, sometimes quite charismatic leaders. But again, that's often hard to sustain in later generations. Important people who study the sociology of religion, um, sociologists like Bainbridge and Starr, often talk about that transition to the second and third generation. It's very easy, maybe, to start up a charismatic church, you know, please send me all your money after that. No, that's um, just a caricature, I'm sorry. But how do you keep it going beyond that? And Bainbridge and Stark often talk about the routinization of the charisma. They're obviously academics with a label like that, aren't they? But how do you routinize or keep a regular pattern going that can sustain? You need patterns of worship. You need structures for passing leadership on. If you don't have those structures, you begin to lose your way, and the movement only survives as long as you've got a very outstanding, bold speaker taking charge. And that can also be destructive with some of those personality types as well. So we're moving into the period where Christianity has been a very spontaneous movement in its early stages. It's been very charismatic in some places, maybe in Coral. And then we are putting in place church structures, more fixed liturgies or the beginnings of that, and they're looking at forming a theology around that. So today we're going to meet some of those figures who are known as apostolic fathers. Um, in a way, I don't like this picture, but um, it was on the internet, so I stole it. This is Ignatius of Antioch, and um, believe me, he's not cuddling the lions. Um, it looks a bit too friendly. So we'll hear a little more about Ignatius um, in a minute, but you can see basically how his end comes about. Um, maybe in some ways a bit like the Apostle Paul's, going to Rome and being poured out as a libation or a drink offering. So who are these figures that we call apostolic fathers? What does the term apostolic father mean? Let me assure you, they were not the fathers of the apostles. So in some ways, it's a misleading term. Um, so they're definitely not apostolic 
or fathers of the apostles, it rather has a dual meaning. It refers to the individuals such as Ignatius and Polycarp who are called apostolic fathers. It also refers to their writings. So um, I will wave this around at some point. Um, in fact, I'll pass it around. This is the standard critical text by my homes with the Greek texts on one side and um, the English on the other side. So I often use this in teaching my advanced Greek course, getting them to read things they're not familiar with. So again, these writings for the corpus known as the Apostolic Fathers. So they're not fathers, they're not predecessors. Rather, if they're anything, they are figures after the apostles. Some of them may have had contact with the apostles themselves. So they are fathers or early Christian leaders who had apostolic contact or lived within a generation or two of the apostles. And this group of writings, I said, largely comes from the late first century to the mid second century. Now, I'm interested in the writings themselves and early Christians start collecting writings. I think this is a leaf of, if I'm right, Papyrus 46, which is one of the most remarkable early Christian codices. A codex is not a scroll. That's how it differs. Many Jewish writings were written on scrolls. You will have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, so rolls of papyrus. The codex was not invented by early Christians, but they were early adopters of the technology. They started collecting their writings together in codices. Now, any of you who've made books or study bookmaking will know basically the way I was going to say you make a book. You don't make them anymore this way. You just put lots of glue in the back and they fall apart quickly. But if you were making good quality books, what you would do is you would get maybe four sheets of paper and you would fold them in half to make a choir. If I take four sheets of paper and fold them in half, how many pages do I have? I hope you'd say that because I wanted someone to be wrong. <laughs> so thank you for being wrong. I cherish you greatly. Anyone like to have a six because it's front of that? It's always a great question. So yeah, you've got a folder. Yeah, yeah. So you've got six, and then you stack these choirs up, sew them together, put some covers on them. You've got a book. Now, P46 is remarkable. It's early. Basically, book technology hasn't um, developed that much. It's about a pile of about 80 sheets, bent it over, and then sewed, sewn it in a one up. So it's a one choir codex. And the trouble with that is the in, innermost leaves protrude quite a bit, and the outer ones have a lot more of the bend the fold to go around. So this is very early, around 200, and it's a collection of Paul's letters, quite a lot of them, maybe about 10 of them. So it's a remarkable tribute to the way early Christians collected texts. They got better at this. They had better choirs. And the next one I'm going to show you is Codex Sinaticus. Does anyone know where you would go to find Codex Sinaticus today? Yes, the British Museum. Does anyone know how the British come to have this? Anyone like to hazard a guess? So I heard someone say, so everyone, we did not steal it. We didn't steal everything. Only our elder Martin no Greek deal get in trouble saying things like that. <laughs> so what happened was, Constantine von Tischendorf um, acquired it. He tells this heroic story of how he went to um, St. the Sinai Mount, the monastery of St. Catherine's, and he discovered the Greek monks actually burning pages as tinder, and he rescued them. Absolute nonsense. They weren't doing this. 
He stole it. And well, he said he was going to borrow it and give it back. He just forgot to do the second part of that. And he donated it to um, the Tsar in Russia. And um, something happens in Russia around 1917, which you're probably familiar with. There's a big revolution. They're not as fond of Christianity after that. So it's quite embarrassing to have probably the world's oldest Bible in a very communist country. So we didn't steal it. We didn't steal it, we bought it. And I think a huge amount of money was paid in the 1930s, about a hundred thousand pounds. And I think half of it was put up by public money and then the rest was by subscription. People were allowed to contribute one pound and no more than one pound, so no one could claim to have more ownership of it. The reason this codex is interesting is it is a fairly complete Bible, Old and New Testaments, in Greek, so the Old Testament's the Septuagint, has the New Testament, and without break at the end of it, it has two writings called the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. And wherever my books got to, you will find those writing in the collection of the Apostolic Fathers. Were they scripture? Were they considered as scripture? People will say, oh, they were at the end. So obviously not. Well, why not kick Revelation into that category? As there's no obvious break there. So again, you know, we've got an early collection of Christian writings, and it does entail or incorporate some of our writings in this collection. So we have this, there's another early, so Codex Sinaiticus, usually dated mid fourth century, 353, no one knows, but round there. Um, there's another codex called Codex Alexandrinus. Does anyone know where that is? Yes? It's where it may have come from. It's now also in the British Library. Does anyone know how we came to get that? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Stole it. No, we did not steal it. How many times? No, no. Uh, uh, no, we were given it. So basically what happened, it came to Britain um, around the reign of Charles I in the 1620s. So, so there was a patriarch in Constantinople, Cyril Luca. He'd been in Alexandria. So what happened was he was very Protestantizing. He admired the Protestant um, movement, theology, admired Martin Luther. Strange, isn't it, for a Greek Orthodox patriarch? And he wanted to gift something to King James, being from Edinburgh, I always have to say this, King James I of England and King James VI of Scotland, you've got to get that in. So because James had um, arranged the King James Bible, the translation, Cyril Lucar was very enamored with this and sent James or wanted to send him this codex. James inconveniently died and so it went to his successor, Charles. So we were given this. The reason Codex Alexandrinus is important is at the back of that, it has two writings, first and second Clement, which are also in the Apostolic Fathers. So our two, two of our major codices, in fact, there are only four major codices of the entire Bible in Greek, in the first millennium. Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, I'm not even going to get you to tell me where that is. If you can't work that out, you're in trouble. Codex Alexandrinus, and one called Codex Ephraimi Siri Rescriptus. Um, why it's called that is um, it's a palimpsest. Does anyone know what that means? Written again, written over. So basically, this 5th century Codex Ephraim Rescriptus had the whole Bible on, on parchment, not papyrus like P46. It was rubbed out, 
um, some of the pages turned sideways, written over in Syriac with the works of St. Ephraim. So we can read some of the underwriting, but only bits of it survive. So really, we only have three great Bibles from the 4th and 5th century. The reason for that is not because people were not reading the scriptures. You know, as we know, God sometimes nearly always speaks in the scriptures. I forget the line. But um, what happened was early Christians collected writings in different ways. I've got a picture of the Nag Hammadi codices here, which maybe date from 3rd, 4th century with leather bindings around them, just to give you an idea that Christians were reading lots of things. But basically, when most early Christian manuscripts of the New Testament occur in sub-collections, we tend to get a collection of the New Testament Gospels, the four Gospels, or we get a collection of Paul's letters. How many texts would have been in the collection of Paul's letters? It does a little, but there's a standard number usually. That's the whole New Testament, just Paul's letters? 14, because we all knew or they knew Paul wrote Hebrews, um, something we don't think nowadays, but Hebrews was lumped in with it. So P46, that early manuscript, it arranges them basically in descending order with the letters to the churches first, then letters to the individual. So it runs Romans, Hebrews, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and then at the back, well, it runs out. There's a debate whether it had the pastorals in or not. But um, so you get the collection of Paul, something called the Apostolos, Acts, and what we would call the Catholic letters. And then Revelation had its own slightly strange circulation history. So codices like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus run with the Gospels, then the Apostolos, Acts, then the Catholic letters, then the Pauline letters, then Revelation, and then these other writings. Now, the Apostolic Fathers, apart from those two codices which had two of the writings in, never seemed to circulate that closely together in the first millennium, as far as we can tell. They tended more often than not to circulate individually. So we've got the idea that early Christians are co collecting writings together. The first printed edition, well, that hasn't come up super clearly, of the Apostolic Fathers was published by Jean-Baptiste Cotelier in 1672. Um, this, you probably can't read this, I think has got the date of something like 1698 on. The reason I did, I actually paid far too much money for a copy of this. Um, I, I saw one in an ad, two volumes, and oh, we're friends. I, I think I paid about 450 pounds for the two volumes. So this is the second edition, which is identical, but published about 25 years later. So Catelier had a lot of the writings in there, Ignatius, the Clements, and so on. One of the reasons the letters of Clement hadn't really been able to be collected with other early apostolic writings is, I told you Codex Alexandrinus came to Britain in the 1620s. The first edition of them was in the 1630s as separate writings. So it wasn't really till around the 17th century that in Western Europe, these writings began, began they didn't finish, coming to light. So we get a lot of these writings beginning to be published together in the late 17th century. What we do have though, that is very important, um, is I've given you, this is the Holmes edition, which is going round. This is the standard edition. These are the writings that you will find in Holmes's edition of the Apostolic Fathers. Now, um, the two letters of Clement, and we'll come on to those in a minute, the seven letters of Ignatius. So there are 11 texts 
that roughly get gathered together or 11 entries in the volume. But we didn't come to know about all of them at the same time. And I'm going to run through a few of those in a minute. But one important manuscript is known as the Jerusalem Codex. And this was discovered in 1873 in the Ju Jerusalem Monastery in Constantinople. Now, why this is important is because it contains a range of writings that you will now find in the Holmes edition. So you've got first and second Clement. That text of second Clement was really important because in Codex Alexandrinus, second Clement, which is the last in the Codex, breaks off around chapter 12, I think out of 20 chapters. So we never had the ending of it. So when Berinius discovered this codex, he got very excited about having the ending of Second Clement. It also had a long recension of the letters of Ignatius. They got played around with and added to later on. And he also found a text of the Didache. This was the first time the text had been discovered in this form. And actually, I think Berinius missed it. It's quite a thick book of Greek and in minuscule, um, lowercase writing. So at first it didn't come to light straight away, he had to work on the codex again. And this caused quite a storm. So the Didache does not get included in that collection of apostolic fathers' writings until about the 1880s is when it begins to get incorporated. People like J.B. Lightfoot and um, in Germany, um, was it Funk or so? They incorporate it for the first time. So this group of texts has been growing at least down to the end of the 19th century with new discoveries. So this is the collection. So just to go back, we have this range of writings we know of no manuscript in antiquity that holds these writings together. So this corpus, this collection, is a modern construct. In some ways, it's a bit of a motley crew. Um, I couldn't see any other motley crew. No, that would be insulting. But, you know, why are these writings together? Because scholars have put them together. Some of them have quite different perspectives, but they do give us some idea of what Christianity in its diverse forms was like in the second century. So first letter of Clement is written. Those Corinthians are still being troublesome. They were troublesome in Paul's day and they're troublesome in Clement's day. What's going on? Why does he write the letter? He's, well, first of all, the letter doesn't name Clement. If we look at Eusebius in the fourth century, he gives a list of bishops in Rome, and one of them is named as Clement. Um, I, I hope this isn't going to offend anyone's ecclesiology. You can disagree with me. Um, obviously, in some faith traditions, it's very important to tra trace a line of succession of bishops in Rome back to Peter. I'm a, and it's often done, the very early ones, on the basis of Eusebius's list. Some of us are a little skeptical of the list. One of the reasons might be that the sixth bishop of Rome is con conveniently named Sixtus, which seems a bit of a construct. Um, so, I mean, Eusebius doesn't just do this for Rome. He does it for the great seas. He wants to prove that they have apostolic foundation and they're traced through it. Rome is quite a disparate. It's a large city in the first and second centuries. And it seems that there were various church groups. Churches didn't look like this, of course. Um, probably meetings scattered over Rome. Some of them are out by the Appian Way and places like this, and they're quite distant, so they're meeting in small groups. There might not have been 
a single bishop in charge of Rome forever. There might, and a scholar, Peter Lamper, talks of the fractionalization of the church in Rome. And the, so it's fractions, it's little bits here and there in different quarters. Anyway, this the Corinthians have been in correspondence with the church or churches in Rome, and someone there or a group of elders, presbyters, writes back to them. The issue at hand is a leadership struggle, continuity, transition. So what has happened, it appears, is certain young men have ousted the older men and taken over. So the church in Rome says, this is despicable, reinstate the, the elders back in their rightful place. And again, don't be arrogant, don't be puffed up. Language of being puffed up comes from 1 Corinthians. So this author who writes 1 Clement definitely knows Paul's letter to the 1 Corinthians and reuses some of that rhetoric. So an interesting text, quite a long one, about 60 odd chapters. Um, if you're looking for your Easter sermon for proofs of the resurrection, 1 Clement gives you one, and I'm sure you'll all want to use this. He write, reminds his readers that there is a bird that lives in the East every 500 years. It evaporates in flames and is reborn again. So the phoenix for Clement is, um, he has no doubt of its existence, is proof of resurrection. He also has other reasons for believing it as well. So there are things in there that seem remarkably contemporary and other things which we think, oh, well, wish he hadn't written that probably, but it tells us what the flavor of understanding was. Clement also cites a lot of um, the scriptures. In fact, nearly all of Isaiah 53, you know, is cited in totality there, again, as a passage that speaks about Christ. So again, we see that early Christian exegesis where the Old Testament is seen as being prophetic and fulfilled in Christ. So again, a long text, one to look at in more detail. I want to come on to Second Clement now. So there's only a few problems with Second Clement. One, it's not by the same person that wrote First Clement. It's not a letter, um, as, and it's not the same author. So apart from that, the title's entirely correct. <laughs> apart from it not being by Clement, not being the second one of the writings and not being a letter. Um, so the and of, I'm happy to go with. Um, so how did it ever become known as Second Clement? Well, in some ways, I think because it's in Codex Alexandrinus, it's placed as a second. It may not even be a letter. It looks more like a homily or a sermon. So one of the issues around this text is what is it doing? What is its purpose? And again, it looks more like an early Christian sermon that may have been given an epistolary or a letter introduction and sent somewhere. Maybe it was a circulating sermon of some sense. Maybe a bit like Hebrews. I mean, Hebrews is a slightly unusual letter for many reasons, if it is a letter. So again, Second Clement is a bit of a mystery, and we don't even quite know where, when it dates to. So it could be second century, it might be later. So an enigmatic text, but whereas first Clement, we have much more knowledge of the situation and its details, we don't have that with second Clement. So I'll just mention that in passing. Now, Ignatius is someone I've worked on a lot, so I mustn't say too much here or we'll definitely run out of time. Ignatius is like a comet bursting on the scene. We only really see and know about him in a very brief period of his life. So these letters, these seven letters, are maybe written in the space of a few weeks. Ignatius is being transported from Antioch 
in Syria to Rome to be executed. And on his way, he's being accompanied by Roman soldiers. He calls them 10 leopards and says, the better they're treated, the worse they behave. So he's allowed to have contact with the Christian groups he goes through. I suspect the way he has contact is that the Christian groups are paying the soldiers. I don't know that, but I think the more money they get, they probably start whacking Ignatius around a bit and say, you know, give us some more money or we'll beat him up. People aren't nice sometimes, especially in the second century, unlike everyone today, of course. Um, so Ignatius is being transported, and on his way, he writes seven letters. Now, these are known as the authentic letters of Ignatius. The corpus grows. Um, where, where do we want to go? In the fourth century, the Arian controversy, the letters added which in some ways seem to have um, an ultra-Aryan perspective and written in the name of Ignatius. Slightly strange because Ignatius's Christology is probably the opposite of Aryan, but maybe that's the reason they wanted to correct them. But that takes us beyond our scope here. Ignatius writes seven letters. Five of them are back either to churches where he stopped on his waypoints, or churches that have sent delegations to visit him while he's at a waypoint. Churches of the Roman province of Asia, modern, I was going to say Turkey, but I have to say Turkia now, don't I? So um, modern Turkey. So these letters get sent back to churches he's visited. There's a per one of the churches is Smyrna. He wrote, writes back to it from Troas before he's going to get on a boat and sends a personal letter to Polycarp, who we'll meet in a little while. But one of the most remarkable letters is one he sends forward to Rome. He writes to the Roman Christians and says, you might think you're going to do me a service if you interfere and prevent my martyrdom. Please do not do that because I am just beginning to become a disciple. So he fears in a way that they will rob him of his crown, his sense of actually following Christ, following the apostles, Paul and Peter. He says, they were apostles, but I'm just beginning to become a disciple. And in some ways, his rhetoric is both at one level, inspiring. You can see genuine faith there. It's also slightly morbid, but is it trying to build up self-confidence um, at another way? So I'll come back to this slide in a minute. This shows his journeys. It's far too small. I apologize. This is Ignatius, and I'm going to quote this bit from uh, his letters to the Romans. To the, I'm writing to all the churches and am insisting to everyone that I die for God of my own free will. Unless you hinder me, I implore you, do not be unseasonably kind to me. And this is where it gets a bit morbid. Let me be food for the wild beasts through whom I can reach God. I am God's wheat and I'm being ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, so that I may prove to be pure bread. Better yet, coax the wild beasts so that they may become my tomb and leave nothing of my body behind me, lest I be a burden to anyone once I've fallen asleep. Then I will truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ when the world will no longer see my body. Pray to the Lord on my behalf so that through the, these instruments, I may prove to be a sacrifice to God. So he knows what's going to come to him. This is not a clean or pleasant ending. Any of you who've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, some of the early martyr accounts or other, um, one thing the Romans knew how to do was how to kill people painfully 
and over a protracted time. And they were rather good at it. And in some ways, maybe Ignatius is right, better to run up to the lions and give them a good kicking and get it over with quickly rather than to have the fear. But Ignatius sees this as his pathway to becoming a disciple. Now, early Christian persecution was sporadic, and it was rarely empire-wide, maybe only the final great persecution in about 307. Um, this was much more sporadic. And in some ways, the Romans didn't care if you're Christian or just a criminal. They needed someone for the entertainment in the Colosseum. They needed a stock of people to do these kind of things. So, yeah, anti-Christian definitely, but not exclusively. They'd pick on anyone they could. So Ignatius goes to his execution uh, to be a spectacle in the Colosseum. Now, I guess part of early Christian rhetoric is world denying. So their rhetoric is, you know, to the Roman officials, you might have think you're having the victory. In fact, you are defeating yourselves. We are having the victory. You might think you're taking away life, but in fact, you're actually giving me my true life. So again, it's inverting standard values. It's world denying, and it's seeing the ultimate reality in a different place. So Ignatius gives voice to that. And many of the other Christian martyrdom accounts, the earliest in some ways is in the book of Acts with Stephen being put to death. But outside the New Testament, this is one of the earliest, probably the earliest account or anticipation of martyrdom. So again, Ignatius tells us about his state of mind. So Ignatius is one of our most important apostolic fathers. Other reasons he's important is that even though we get in the New Testament in different places, terms like episkopos for bishop, um, in it's also, it uses it in the plural in Philippians, we get the term presbyters and deacons. Even in the pastoral epistles, you don't get all three together. You might get um, bishops and deacons, or you might get um, yeah, presbyters in some places. But Ignatius is the first to strongly assert a threefold pattern of ecclesial hierarchy. And he, one of his criticisms of the church, as he writes back to, are there some people who are dissenting. They're not adopting this pattern, or they're not supporting the bishop. I think it would be wrong to say he supports monarchical episcopacy, sort of a kingly, a prince bishop, but he does support mono, a, a single bishop surrounded by a council of presbyters and having deacons who carry out some of the duties. Often the deacons, by the time of Justin, Justin Martyr, another martyr, would those who couldn't attend communion, they would take the bread and wine to them on a Sunday. Often they were slaves. They couldn't get away. So Ignatius, very important, very important for church governance, for routinizing the charisma, putting structures in place, strong advocacy of um, Eucharistic theology. I, I would say definitely not transubstantiate, but a sense of real presence or communion with Christ and Christ's presence in the elements. So we get some of these early theological ideas emerging here. So some people will say Christianity as we have it today is all an invention of Nicaea or Chalcedon in the fourth or fifth century. Please give people who say that my book um, that I'm passing around of the text, get them to read Ignatius, and they will find they've got a problem. Some people want to date the authentic letters late. And in fact, during, Ignatius has always been a con 
controversial figure in his own day, in the 17th century, people were arguing whether these were forgeries, basically to solve their ecclesiastical debates. So there were some people more on the Catholic side of the Reformation who would appeal to the letters of Ignatius as justifying their points of view, especially the long recension in, from the fall, which even has Ignatius writing to the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Mary writing back to Ignatius in Latin, not even in Greek. So um, slight giveaway, but um, the authentic letters a part of a journey toward that more developed theology. But there is a pathway of Christian theological development. Things are not static, they're developing. And again, I think that's part of the lesson for those period of transition that we were hearing Paul making. And, um, you know, when you have to hand things on to the next generation, one of the lessons I think the Apostolic Fathers teach us is you cannot control the future. You have to trust the people you're handing on to. They will do things differently. Oh, they don't do it how we used to do it. And you don't do it like people 50 years before. It's called life. So, I mean, transitions are a handing on, a trusting, but handing on things that are central. Anyway, we should probably leave Ignatius and go on to Polycarp of Smyrna. So this is modern Smyrna, and you've got some of the ruins. It is Mia in Turkey, Smyrna. So Polycarp lived in Smyrna. I think he was a fairly young man relatively when Ignatius visited him, maybe late 30s, 40s, that time, time of life. And um, he's very receptive to Ignatius. They strike up a good friendship. In many ways, I think Polycarp is the most important figure, controversial statement, of the second century for Christianity. I think he's the central figure. He knows Ignatius at the beginning of the second century. He lives probably till the 150s. Irenaeus at the end of the second century, around the 180s, has met Polycarp. Polycarp, Ignatius is quite a, a prickly character. Polycarp seems more conciliatory. Polycarp has been to Rome and met, by this stage, I do think there is a bishop around the 150s, Bishop Anacetus. They have a debate about when Easter should be celebrated, known as the quarter decimal controversy see Wikipedia for details. Um, the date of Easter, is it related to the Jewish Passover or not? Polycarp and Anicetus agree that they can do things differently. Why couldn't we have done that more often in early Christianity? But they're happy that each other's practice is authentic. So they go their ways. Polycarp though, isn't always as conciliatory as that. Um, Apparently, Polycarp was in a, a Roman bath um, having his ablutions, and Marcion uh, comes in, and he runs out of the bathhouse naked, worried it will fall down because um, the offspring of Satan has come in, he calls him. Be gone, you offspring of Satan. I never had the opportunity to call anyone offspring of Satan, but maybe you can use it even if I haven't. So, Polycarp is in, he lives a lot of the second century, at least the first half. And just by hanging around, sometimes you become important. He doesn't leave a lot of writings behind. He leaves a single letter that um, this to the Philippians. And again, the Philippians have written to Polycarp, a bit like the Corinthians were in correspondence with Clement, and the Philippians have a problem in church. They've got a problem with one of their presbyters, one of the elders in the church. Does anyone know what the problem was or what can go wrong in church? It looks like Valens has had his 
fingers in the collection plate. Same problems, embezzlement. So Valens has been discovered, kicked out, no longer worthy of his presbytership. I think that's a word. And Polycarp writes to them, it's a long preamble. You wonder why, what's he going on about the love of money and putting the right... And then toward the end, you think, ah, now he's long intro, but the real problem is Valens. But Polycarp in chapter 11 says, you know, with Valens, don't be too hard on him. So there's a pastoral heart there. He says, if there is repentance, welcome him back into the community. So again, this is written to the Philippians. And do I have yeah, it's the sole surviving response to the letter. Interestingly, his letter cites eight or nine of Paul's letters. So this letter to the Philippians is written soon after Ignatius has gone through Smyrna, where Polycarp is, and even around the 110s, 115s, when this is written, already Polycarp knows a collection of Paul's letters. Many of Paul's letters were written to places in modern Turkey, the province of Asia, Ephesus. So maybe Polycarp's been responsible in some sense for collecting these letters or knows an early collection. He also asked that the letters of Ignatius be sent to him. So with the letters of Ignatius, Polycarp seems instrumental in collecting those and I wonder, because of the manuscript history, of the seven authentic letters, six come together in a codex, the ones to the churches in Asia. The letter to the Romans always had a separate circulation history. So I basically wonder if Polycarp couldn't get a copy of that back, and the six circulated and Romans came in later, perhaps my scholarly speculation, so please treat it with a pinch of salt. Um, so again, Valens and Polycarp knows, well, there's a big question. Um, does he know whether Ignatius is dead or does he not? So in the beginning of the letter, he says many to the Philippians, many martyrs have passed through you on the way to Rome. You know, so it sounds like he knows Ignatius is dead, but at the end he requests information about what's happened to Ignatius. Some people have thought this is two letters stitched together. I don't think the difficulty is insurmountable. I think he may know Ignatius is dead or likely to have died, but doesn't know the details. But some people, Harrison in the late 1930s, has a really nice book called Polycarp's Two Epistles, where he advances the theory that the last two chapters were a separate earlier letter that got stitched onto the back of Polycarp's the, um, main letter, which was written later. Um, yeah, one letter or two. Polycarp himself, oh, I shouldn't go back, ends up burnt. So he's martyred also. And the text in which we hear about this is the martyrdom of Polycarp. So it's written as a letter from the church in Smyrna to the church at Philomelium, telling of Polycarp's death. It is the earliest written martyrdom account. So Ignatius anticipates his martyrdom, but this is an actual third party, if we like, account of Polycarp's life leading up to his death and his martyrdom burnt at the stake in Smyrna. So basically what happens, Polycarp is warned that there's a pogrom, he's going to be burnt, he runs away from a, to a farmhouse and he's taken on board by, oh sorry, he's arrested and he's offered the chance to worship or worship the um, intelligence of the emperor, but he says these, in the archaic translation, these four score and six years I have served my Lord who's done me no wrong, how can I deny him now? So he's burnt at the stake and 
miraculous things happen, the flames won't burn at first and things like this. But in the end, he's burnt to death at the age of 86 for his faith. The dating's uncertain. Eusebius sort of confuses the issue a bit. He dates it around 167, but inscriptional evidence about status quadratus, the proconsul, seems to suggest he was in Smyrna around 156. So you've got Polycarp dying around the middle of the century. Interestingly, in chapter four, the text um, recounts the case of Quintus, who is a voluntary martyr. He goes up to the Roman um, governor or proconsul and says, I am a Christian, you know, kill me so I can go to, and then he gets panicky and backs out and can't go through with it. And the text makes clear, and I think it must make it clear because this is happening more than once, that some people are almost suicide martyrs. They're offering themselves up for death because the martyrs begin to get venerated when they're being held. They get a lot of adoration. And this text makes it clear you should not give yourself up for martyrdom, but if it comes your way, you shouldn't run away from it. So that basically is the message of the text. Should I break up what you want me to do? It's five past 11. I, I can go for about 10 minutes. Is that okay? Or, or I, All right, let's skip over the martyrdom. Um, the text I'm going to get on to now is the Didache, and I'm not the expert in the room, uh, but I will draw attention to the expert. The Didache is a really important text. It's important because it's probably, and I think we agree, a composite text. It's grown in stages, and at its earliest level, it seems to embed some very early insights into Christianity. It talks about things like early Eucharistic practice, what to do with wandering teachers. So you've still got um, this radical wandering element. It hasn't quite fully been routinized, but maybe it's looking at what you do in some aberrant cases. And some of its ideas become maybe normative or taken up in other strands of Christianity. So. Um, there's a certain person who's written quite extensively on the Didache. If you ever get to hear from him or meet him, I, I recommend you take that opportunity. But part of the Didache, it has a two ways document at the beginning. It talks about the way of life and the way of death. This kind of um, genre of text is known in Judaism, maybe even in some Qumran text. So this type of rhetoric is well known. Um, it also has instructions about some of what we would call sacramental elements, how to baptize someone, how to perform the Eucharist and so on, a version of the Lord's Prayer and so on. But um, I haven't done the Didache justice, and I know you're so, I apologize, but maybe there can be a lecture on the Didache at times. Another text, and I'm just going to go through them quite quickly now, the Epistle of Barnabas, in a way, very anti-Jewish in its rhetoric. And what it basically says is something many early Christians begin saying from the late second century onwards, that scriptures not only foretold of Jesus and were fulfilled in Jesus, but they were really written all about Jesus. And they are Christian writings, not Jewish writings. So in some sense, it's a bit of a dirty word, but some of this is supersessionist. They're saying, those scriptures were not about you, they're about us. And one thing Barnabas says is that, when did Israel lose its status? When did it lose its place of prestige? With the crucifixion of Jesus? Not for, No, no. He'll say to the Jews, you lost it when you made for yourself the golden car. So you lost it even before Moses came down the mountain with the tablets. So basically, he castigates Jews as always being apostate. So 
if you have any interfaith groups with um, Jewish people in Harrogate, I suggest you don't start with this text. It's probably not going to be the most conciliatory, but it does show why we need to have those conversations in some ways. All right, Epistle of Barnabas, I'm going to skip. It's usually, I think it's responding to the Bar Kokhba rebellion of 132, um, another Jewish revolt, the third one, because toward the end, it talks about, behold, those who tore down the temple, the Romans, are now building it up again. So the Romans attempted to rebuild or did rebuild the temple to Jupiter on the site of the Jerusalem temple in the 130s after the Bar Kokhba rebellion. So again, these apostolic fathers' writings are in the first half of the second century. Shepherd of Hermas is the longest writing by far among the apostolic fathers. I think in that book, it takes up about 200 pages with facing English and Greek. Very popular text. For me, it's the most boring, but I shouldn't say that. I can never get into it. I, I have read it. I, I had to. I was examining a PhD on it. So it's it's quite apocalyptic at times, and it's a visionary text, um, and it comprises of um, basically three sections. It has visions at the beginning that the seer sees, then the, a long section of 12 commandments, and then this parable section. The text does not survive fully in Greek. It's in the back of Sinaiticus. We've lost the last part. So in that book, if you were to look at it, the end of it is Latin with facing English because only the ending survives in Latin. Right. Oh. So, yeah, longest text. Its piety is slightly different from some of the others. It's based on observing the commandments and encratism, self-control, to be encratic, encratia in Greek. In fact, it's in the fruit of the spirit, isn't it? Um, fruit of the self-controlled, encratia in Galatians. So refers to the spirit in a variety of ways. It's quite hard to get into the mindset. This is a fresco of the good shepherd, or maybe the shepherd of Hermas in the catacombs in Rome. That's why I've thrown that up. Fragment of Quadratus. This is the only apostolic father I will give you the full text for. Eusebius cites one fragment from it. And what this says is, um, so Eusebius says, um, he shows his early date by what he reveals in his own utterance. And this is the quote, but the works of our savior were always present for they were true. Those who were healed, those who were raised from the dead, who were seen uh, when healed and raised, but were always present and not just while the Savior was here, but even when he had gone, those who were healed and raised remained for a long time so that some of them have survived even into our own time. So Quadratus is writing at a time when those that are healed or raised by the Savior, there were some people alive in Quadratus's day who had known those people. He didn't know them. So this is like, um, what is it? I, I dance with a man who danced with a woman who danced with that, you know, it's sort of that kind of remove on. And Eusebius says of Quadratus, he was such a person also, Aristides. They're writing apologies. This isn't making excuses. This is an apologia, a defense of the Christian faith. This is almost another genre of literature that starts maybe in the beginning of the second century, but comes to full flourishing with the apologists in the second half of the, Justin Martyr writes his apologies, Athenagoras, Theophilus, Origen, these people are writing defenses of the Christian faith. Another text is the, and maybe this is the last one I'll cover in detail, the Epistle of Diognetus, unfortunate text. Um, does anyone know where this text was rediscovered. 
In about the 1430s in Constantinople, something happens in the 1450s in Constantinople. Does anyone remember? Yeah. The Ottomans took it over. Yeah, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Any idea where you would discover a manuscript of an important early Christian work in Constantinople in the 1430s? Likely places? Yes, do. Monastery? Excellent guess. Thank you for being wrong again. <laughs> um, I, I, I shouldn't pick on you. It was discovered in a fish and chip shop. Well, a fishmonger's, I shouldn't be. A student, um, a monk, went there and his fish was being wrapped in disused manuscript. And um, Thomas Arezzo was his name. And it was 1436. Um, I will come on to that. So it was discovered in a fish and chip shop and began to be published in the early 1500s transcriptions. Unfortunately, we now have no text and we don't know the original context beyond the fish shop, um, but it was burnt in the Franco-Prussian War, so it no longer survives. So it's, this is a bit like a lemming, I think, you know, survives for a brief time, then chucks itself over a cliff. Um, so, but we do have transcriptions that we base this on. So this is a series of works on the Apostolic Fathers. They're far too expensive, but they are some of the classic works there. The other thing, um, another text is by Papius of Heraclius. Again, we only have fragments of these texts. And my one of my um, colleagues, Stephen Carlson, has just brought this wonderful book out that gathers all the evidence for these fragments over maybe 1500 years. So he identifies only 16 fragments from the work, but about 98 testimony to that work. So at the end of the book, you get an odd bits and pieces of text that survive from the period. Papias lived around the 130s. He wrote a work an exposition of the Dom Dominical Logia. So he's um, writing expository notes, perhaps, on Jesus' sayings. We don't have... One of the important things he talks about, Mark recording the sayings of Peter in Rome. So we get those traditions through what Eusebius cites of Papias. Eusebius didn't like Papias. He said he was a man of dim wits. Um, but really, I think the reason he says that is Papias believed in the thousand reign of year reign of Christ based on Revelation Eusebius. So they didn't live at the same time, but they had a bit of history, if you like. So uh, you can't really believe what Eusebius says about him. And these are just a few books if you want to read further. These are books about the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. If you only read one thing, read the text. Far more interesting than anything I've said or anyone can say about it, but I've gone on too long as, as is my want. I apologize to you all, but thank you for being so attentive. And caffeine awaits, I believe. Brilliant, thank you. So let's go and get a drink and be back here at 11.30 for half an hour of questions. Okay, then we'll be back at 11.30.